Well, my friends, it's almost Christmas Eve, isn't it? Just a little bit longer and it will be here. Ready or not, it's coming. We will have the Christmas story told through carols and songs and scripture and through a nativity drama. Now, most of us, when we think about the Christmas story, we think about it the way the Gospel of Luke tells that story. You know, the story that's told with the shepherds kneeling at the manger and the heavenly host of angels singing, Glory to God in the highest. The spotlight shines on Mary and the little baby Jesus in the manger. And we would sing about to that sweet little manger and no crying the little Lord Jesus makes. The spotlight shines on them, but one of the characters, Joseph, usually doesn't have any speaking part at all. No spotlight on Joseph. Unless, of course, like the drama that we're going to have on Christmas Eve, we give Joseph one line where he inquires of the innkeeper, please, don't you have somewhere that my very pregnant wife can lie down and rest? But more often than not, Joseph is relegated to the back row of the scene. He's standing behind Mary and the baby and the shepherds and even behind the wise men or the magi. So it's certainly not hard for me to believe a little story that I heard not long ago about a worried mother who called the church office one day. She said that her young son was supposed to play the part of Joseph in the church nativity play, but he'd come down with a bad cold, and he was in bed on doctor's orders. Well, when the news got to the choir director who was leading the nativity play, the choir director said, Oh, I'm so sorry to hear that he's sick, but you know, it's really too late for me to find someone else to play the role of Joseph. We'll just have to write Joseph out of the script. Can you imagine that? Writing Joseph out of the script of the Christmas story. But that's exactly what they did that night. They went through the entire nativity pageant without a Joseph. And here is the surprising thing. Very few people in the congregation even noticed. Joseph, you see, is one of those nondescript characters in the Christmas story. He's so easy to overlook and leave out of the story. I mean, you've got to have Mary and the baby Jesus, and you've got to have one or two shepherds, and you've got to have at least three wise men or kings because you've got the three gifts coming to the manger, and maybe one or two animals to make it a realistic nativity scene for anyone to look at. But you know, whenever I've bought a nativity set, I can easily tell what Mary looks like and the baby Jesus. And I can tell who the wise men are supposed to be because they're the ones holding the little boxes, the little gifts in their hands. But usually there are two other figures in there, male figures. And they look very similar. They're both holding staffs of some sort. And it's hard to tell which one's supposed to be a shepherd and which one's supposed to be Joseph. Are, are, are they both shepherds and Joseph got left out altogether? So it's not surprising that when you walk into many houses, you might see their nativity scene set up and they really have a shepherd in the place by the manger where Joseph is supposed to be. They get the figures confused and mixed up. It makes me wonder about this nondescript Joseph. But Fred Craddock, a marvelous preacher and former professor at Candler School of Theology at Emory University, once stated this about Joseph. He said, followers of Jesus owe a lot 
to the unassuming Joseph. For it was Joseph who helped Mary raise Jesus. It was Joseph who helped Mary care for Jesus when he was an infant and a child. It was Joseph who made sure that Jesus was fed and clothed. It was Joseph who taught Jesus about carpentry. It was Joseph who took Jesus to the synagogue. There are many lessons that we can learn from the story of Joseph. But for today, I want to focus on the fact that the scripture passage that I just read for us today tells us that the Christmas story really starts with a dream that Joseph had. The Christmas story starts with a dream. Now, I never really thought about that before, but as I pondered over this scripture, I found it very interesting because Christmas is a time of year when so many of us express our dreams, things that we're dreaming of. Think about that popular Christmas song, I'm Dreaming of a White Christmas. We dream about things this time of year. So I wonder, what have you been dreaming for lately? What have you been dreaming for lately? Maybe you're like me and you're dreaming about new possibilities in the new year because life has been difficult for many of us. Just listening to Austin's pastoral prayer today, we're reminded of the tragedies that happen in our world. The people who are suffering because of the tornadoes that hit. Many of us are dreaming of the day that we can come to worship without wearing a mask. Amen? We're dreaming of a time that this pandemic will finally end. We're dreaming of a new day and a new beginning. But others of you may be dreaming about more tangible things like some more jewelry or maybe new electronics, or maybe bicycles or toys wrapped up and sitting under your Christmas tree on Christmas morning. Dreams. A few years ago, just a few days before Christmas, I read a story about a woman who woke up one morning. It was just three days before Christmas. She woke up that morning and she told her husband, Honey, I just dreamed that you gave me a pearl necklace for Christmas. What do you think that dream means? <laughs> and the husband said, Oh, I don't know. You'll know the day after tomorrow. Well, the next day she woke up and she said, Honey, you won't believe it. I just had that same dream that you gave me a pearl necklace for Christmas. What do you think that dream means? Well, you'll know tomorrow, he said. So on that third day, the woman woke up, and you can imagine what she said to her husband, right? Honey, I had that dream for the third time. The dream where you gave me a pearl necklace for Christmas? What do you think that dream means? And he said, you'll know tonight. Well, that evening, the man came into the house carrying a small wrapped package, and he presented it to his wife. She was so delighted and excited, and she opened it very gently. And when she did, she found inside a book. <laughs> and the title of the book was The Meaning of Dreams. <laughs> Well, dreams, we all have them. 
But Joseph did not need a book to tell him the meaning of the dream that he received from the angel in the story that we just read. He knew what that dream meant. He knew and he believed and trusted in what the angel was telling him. The angel told him that the baby to be born to Mary was born of the Holy Spirit and that he was to name the baby Jesus, which means God saves. That this baby would save us from sin and guilt. That this baby would save all people from despair and hopelessness, that this baby would save us from all that seeks to rob us of the joy, the peace, the hope, and the love that God wants us to experience in this life. But the angel also told Joseph that the baby would have another name and that that name would be Emmanuel, the Hebrew name that means God is with us. And that's the essence, my friends, of what we as followers of Jesus Christ celebrate at Christmas. We celebrate the fact that God is with us. That God took on human flesh and entered into this world. That God's presence is near us. Whether we're aware of it or not, God's presence is here with us. And there's nothing we can do to draw God closer to us or to push God further away from us but because God wants to be in a relationship with us. God is near to us in the here and now, whether we realize it or not. And in the words of the Christian hymn, Joy to the World by Isaac Watts, we believe that God's nearness signals the fact that Jesus comes to make God's blessings flow far as the curse is found. And that's why we can have joy in our hearts. And the scriptures tell us that the best place for us to look for God's presence, for God's nearness in the world, is to look at ordinary people and ordinary events in the world today. The angel of the Lord, when you think about it, appeared to Joseph, an ordinary man. The angel did not appear to a king or a prince or a rich person, but to a simple carpenter. God's word came to him not in a show of flashy lights and spectacular music and soundtracks, but rather in the quietness of his dreams when he was alone. A very ordinary time in an ordinary man's life. And God often comes to us in those ordinary, everyday ways. If you stop to think about it, God has always come in those ordinary ways. Think back in the Old Testament to Abraham, the father of faith. Abraham didn't have anything special about him at all. And in fact, Abraham turned out to be a coward at times. Abraham the father of faith, often struggled to trust in God in difficult situations, and yet God came near to him and used him in powerful ways. Think about how Jesus used ordinary fishermen as the ones who would spread the news of his life, his death, and his resurrection to all of us who would establish the church God loves to use ordinary people to touch our hearts, our lives, and our world with those gifts of joy, peace, hope, and love. It seems that ordinary people, even like you, even like me, can be used to bring God's joy into this world. For years now, you know, I've listened to a number of people in the church who come up to me and they say that they don't enjoy Christmas anymore because they say Christmas isn't what it used to be. It's too commercial now. It's been taken over by the stores and Santa Claus. It's been taken over by consumerism. Too much traffic and too much pressure to buy, buy, buy. 
Well, I don't deny that there's some truth in those observations, but I believe that many of those people who come to me with that complaint are really their own Grinches. They're robbing themselves of the joy that is Christmas because they're so focused on the negative things that are going on that they miss out on the positive things that are going on every day. There are ordinary miracles happening every day, my friends, especially this time of year when people's hearts are more receptive, more receptive to hearing God's still small voice pushing them and prodding them to love one another more. Just this morning, as I was looking at my Facebook page, I happened upon a feed that the Reverend Diane Mosley, the former director of Killingsworth Home here in Columbia, posted. Diane posted a picture of herself and eight of her friends who went to a local restaurant yesterday for breakfast, and this is what she wrote. We did it. It was so much fun. We went out to breakfast, and each of the nine of us brought with us a crisp $50 bill. After yummy pancakes, lots of laughing and swapping stories, we got up to go and pay our tickets. And on the way out, each of us handed our server a $50 bill, which was quickly covered with tears. That waitress insisted on hugging each of us and it's one of the best hugs of the season. Try it. You'll like it, Diane says. Giving of yourself at Christmas. An ordinary miracle from ordinary people spreading the joy of the season to others. Let me ask you, where in life do you see God using ordinary people like that to bring God's joy into the world. For our world needs more joy, doesn't it? And God may just be calling you to be that angel who spreads that good news of joy in the world today. Several years ago, Sarah McLaughlin sang a song entitled Ordinary Miracles. And among the words in that song, she sings these. When you wake up every day, please don't throw your dreams away. Hold them close to your heart because we are all a part of the ordinary miracle. The sun comes up and shines so bright, it disappears again at night. That's just another ordinary miracle today. Ordinary miracles are all around us today. Joseph was an ordinary man, but he said yes to the dream that God placed on his heart. And he took Mary as his wife and named his child Jesus Emmanuel. Joseph helped to bring God's joy into the world by saying yes to that dream. So I ask you again, what have you been dreaming about lately? What are the dreams that God has placed on your heart to make this world more joy-filled? Where are the people and the places that you believe need more joy in this world? Where are the places that you can make an impact in that way? Here's how one high school football coach believed that he could bring more joy into the world. It was the end of the football season. It happened at Greatville Faith Christian School in 2008. Greatville Faith Christian School is located 20 miles north of Dallas. And the Faith Lions, as they were called, had 70 players and 11 coaches. They had the best equipment that money could buy. They do everything big with football in Texas, you know. The team was 7-2 and two going into this game against a team from Gainesville. And although Gainesville's school was only 50 miles to the north, 
Gainesville might have well have been a million miles away for all the differences between these two teams. The Gainesville team only had 14 players and one coach. They had no field of their own, so they had to play every one of their games on the road. They usually only had a few fans who traveled with them, and they didn't have any cheerleaders or any band to play for them. They entered the game 0-8, having scored only two touchdowns the entire season. Now, you need to know, Gainesville School is a maximum security prison for teenagers. Knowing the great disparity between these two teams, Faith's head coach, Chris Horgan, came up with a truly radical plan. This was his idea. He said, what if for one game the Faith community split their fans in half? And half of our fans sat on the opposing team's side. And what if we sent our JV cheerleaders over to cheer for the opposing team? After that idea was announced, one player walked into the coach's office and asked, Coach, why are we doing this? Why are we giving them half of our fans and our JV cheerleaders? And the coach responded, Son, imagine if you didn't have a home life. Imagine if everyone had pretty much given up on you. Now imagine what it would mean if hundreds of people suddenly believed in you. And so, for one night, when the Gainesville players got off the bus and had their handcuffs removed, they ran onto the field through a throng of cheering fans, through one of those paper banners held by cheerleaders. And their side of the field, those stands were filled with cheering fans. One of the players commented on that, and he said, I thought those people were confused. You know, they started yelling, defense, when their team had the ball. And another player said, you know, we can tell that people are a little afraid of us every time we go to a game. <clears throat> you can see it in their eyes. They're looking at us like we're nothing but criminals. But these people, these people, these people, they were yelling for us. They were yelling our names. Coach Horgan's message to the faith community was simple. Here's the message I want you to send, he said. I want you to tell those players that they are just as valuable as any other person on earth. And although faith beat them 33 to 14, for that one night, the Gainesville football players were just as normal. They felt just as normal as anyone else. After the game, the faith players gathered at the center of the field for prayer, and the Gainesville quarterback and linebacker, whose name was Isaiah. How's that for a Christmas message, right? He joined those players in prayer. And he asked them, can I lead the prayer? They had no idea what this kid was going to say. But Coach Horgan said, sure, Isaiah, you go right on ahead. And Isaiah prayed this prayer. Lord, I don't know how this happened, so I don't even know how to say thank you. But I've never known there were so many people in this world that cared about us. 
as the Gainesville players made their way back to the bus surrounded by 12 security guards. They were handcuffed for their ride back to prison. But their coach grabbed Coach Horgan and he said, you'll never know what joy you brought into these boys' lives. You'll never, ever know. My friends, we had the opportunity to be those bearers of joy in this world, to bring more joy into the world as we will allow God's dreams to become our dreams for what this world can be and as we do what we can to bring God's ordinary miracles to bear. May we have the faith and the courage to so live in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.